All right, so very good afternoon to you. And we are continuing this uh, topic too, as it appears, uh, the leverage and the firm valuation. Uh, I know I will not start from the beginning because you've done quite substantial part already. And I know that we were, last week when we met, we were having discussion about Modigliani and Miller theorem, which is a, one of the very, uh, how to say, kind of theoretical pillars uh, in the field of finance. And the gist of their ideas was that uh, the company, the firms, they create values through the asset side and the balance sheet liability side is only to support them. But today, hopefully, we'll prove them wrong. And we would prove that actually you can generate value through the liability side. Instead of discussing the theory, let's take an example. And we'll, we'll come back to theory. But let's see something with our own eyes. There are two firms. One is labeled as L, which means uh, leverage. The other is U, which means unlevered or unleveraged. And I assume that you know that unlevered company is that which has zero debt. And the levered company is the one which has debt. And just to let you know that most of the public companies in the world, or even not only public company, but most of the business corporate business organizations in the world, they have debt. So mostly, uh, I don't have any percentage, what percentage, but I would say that it's very rare to find a business organization with zero debt. Even though I remember uh, in the, let's say 2007, eight, during that time, if you look at the balance sheet of Microsoft or Apple at that time, yeah, you, you will not be surprised to see zero debt. But now things have changed and the companies are borrowing. Uh, anyways, we have two companies and look at the starting point. The starting point is EBIT. EBIT is earnings before interest and tax. So essentially your EBIT is showing your operating profit. So it means that the profit which the levered company and the unlevered company, they have earned because of their operations is constant, is same, not constant, but same. It means that their operational performance, so the value which they have created via the asset side is same. Do you get my point? That is why my starting point is EBIT, operating profit. Profit arising from the company's operations. And I on purpose kept it constant. I want to prove that even two companies whose value generated by assets is same, but their total value can still differ because the liability side can also create some value in one firm, whereas in the other firm, the liability side may not create the value. And this would be enough to disprove Modigliani and Miller's theorem, right? One simple example, and we can challenge, we can challenge the Nobel Prize winning hypothesis. But, yeah, all right. Now, as we know, the U firm has zero debt. Because it has zero debt, you have to keep, you have to be very careful with the cursor is, okay? Because the U company has zero debt, therefore the, they pay no interest. On the contrary, the L firm, the levered company has $1,000 as debt. Yeah, and let's assume that uh, the rate of interest, the risk-free rate of interest is 8%. It means 
this company would cut $80 from its income statement, will it? Mm -hmm. 8% on 1,000 is $80. 8% on zero debt is zero interest. Then, when you deduct it, we have the profit before tax or the pre-tax income. Thousand minus zero is thousand. Thousand minus 80 is 920. This is the profit or the earnings before tax, or we can also call it gross profit. And then we carry on that both companies are exposed to 34% corporate tax. And when you apply 34% on 1000, it becomes 340. And 34% on 920 is 312.80. And then guess what happens? The net profit, the profit, before uh, the profit after tax, the earnings after tax, or the net income available for shareholders is 1000 minus 340, 660. For the L company, 920 minus 312.80 is 607.2. This is the net profit available for the shareholders of the company for unlevered company, and this is the net profit available for the shareholders of the levered company. Then we know that the investors are of two types, the bond investors and the equity investors. How much the cash flow goes to the investors of the unlevered company, zero interest plus 660 net profit, which means 660, yeah? Make sense? How much cash flow go to the investors of the unlevered uh, levered company? Well, there's $80 of interest plus 607.20 as the net profit, 687. Look at the difference. Levered company has been able to generate $27.20 more value for its investors than the unlevered company. Whereas, whereas the income generated from the asset side was same. And this difference which has been caused is caused solely alone by the liability side of the balance sheet. Isn't. This 27.20 is not generated by any asset. It's all about financing. And we know that financing is uh, shown on the liability side of the balance sheet. This company had no debt, so it doesn't generate any value to the debt holders, but it generates more value to the shareholders. On the other hand, this company uh, generates some value for debt holders, but then because its financing is including both debt and equity, therefore it generates lesser value for equity investors. But when you add up both cash outflows, the sum of the value given to the L company's investors is more by this margin, by this difference. It means this value has been generated by the balance sheet, the liability side. Thus, we prove Modigliani and Miller wrong. Thus, we can prove, we can say that uh, even the financing can create, it's not only investment which create value, it's also the financing which creates value. And if you look at, if you look at this 27.20, one way is that you find the difference between the two side, but when you dig deeper, when you analyze it more, you find that this 27.20, if you want to formulate it, it is actually tax rate multiplied by 
the amount of interest. So for example, uh, remember this 27.20. So if I, for instance, multiply, this is called the formula is PC, the corporate tax rate multiply by the amount of interest. The interest was $80 and the tax rate was 34%, which means 0 0.34 multiply, it comes to be, it comes to be 27. Point twenty. In other words, if without going too much, once you understand the concept, all you need to do is multiply effective tax rate by the amount of interest the company pays, and that difference would show the additional value created by the levered company when compared with the unlevered company. Make sense? So therefore, this is a discussion that basically this 27.20 is the additional value created by the company, but actually this value uh, is in a, in, a, in a way, this is uh, thankfully created by the government because the government is doing what? The government is keeping the interest payments tax deductible. So let's assume that on the right hand side of my, uh, in this class, uh, people who are sitting, they are getting the interest. So they are sharing this interest. And on my left hand side, people are sitting who will be sharing the six or 7.20. The right hand side people, the debt holders, you deserve 8% on 1000. So you deserve altogether $80 and you pay no tax. I promise you to pay $80 and I pay you. Whereas these people, when they get 660, they have to, or, or even these people, six or 7.20, they have to first pay the tax. So there's a barrier, there's a tax barrier here. The debt holders have no tax barrier, so thanks to. So just imagine, just imagine that, uh, just imagine there was no tax, hypothetically. Imagine there's no tax, then this would be zero, yeah, am I right? This would be zero. This would be thousand. This would be 920. And 920 plus 80 would be thousand and thousand plus zero would be thousand. So no difference. So this additional value is created by taxation regime. Now tax is not part of your assets. Tax is not part of your uh, operational performance. In fact, you don't have any control over tax tax is imposed by the state. <laughs> so I would say, I would say, let's compare, let's go further. In a country where for a given amount of debt, the tax rate is low. Let's say very capitalistic countries. For example, I, I uh, most of the countries, uh, like for example, US or many Southeast Asian countries, they're very investor friendly. And one of the gesture to show their investor friendliness is that they have very low corporate tax, very low corporate tax rate. I worked in Singapore, so I know that the corporate tax rate is very, very low there. It means that in the low tax countries, this difference will not be much. Hmm. You know why? Because tax rate is low. How can this number be more? How can this 27.20 be more? Either, oh, what is that? Either, either I borrow more, but if the borrowing is same, 
then the interest rate is more and if the tax rate is more so i would say that if these two companies l and u are based in singapore then everything else being equal the this value which is generated it would be comparatively lower but imagine these companies are in finland <laughs> yeah or any other nordic country then this figure would be very high all else being equal because the tax rate is more 34% on at is 2720 if tax rate is only 4% then 4% on at would be 3.2 so then the difference would be very less do you get my point if tax rate was 9% then this would be 7.20 but now it's 27.20 because tax rate is more if tax rate is 50 50% even more then this would be 40 so what i'm saying is that the value created by the liability aspect the liability side uh, would be more if you are in a more high tax countries vis-a-vis -vis a lower tax country or if you borrow more or if you pay high interest but all these things if you borrow more more interest tax they are not operational things so basically we are challenging or we have challenged or in a way we have proved uh, modigliani and miller wrong in this calculation so this is a very important thing which you must learn uh, that the value can be created by the liability side of the balance sheet as well so we move on so we continue so basically this 34% is thanks to the government thanks to the tax man the tax man's attitude towards debt so in a way this is a kind of subsidy which the debt holders are getting from the state just imagine just imagine this 27.20 happened one year and we have a reason to believe that in the following years things will not change and every year the business situation would remain same we want to model it uh, that's why we take these assumptions and everything would be same and let's assume that the 27.20 would be a uh, an annual increment to the levered company in comparison to the unlevered company it means that this 27.20 will occur to you to to the to the levered company every year yeah let's assume it then in the in the in the finance language we use a phrase perpetuity perpetuity is the annual cash flow you get for rest of your life basically it's like a pension isn't so that people get pension they get till they remain alive yeah uh, there's also a phrase called annuity annuity is that there is a certain period you get and afterward you don't get it for example uh you have given um, amount on loan or let's say you keep in the bank uh one 10000 euros at 5% rate of interest you keep it for 5 year you get the interest rate at the end of each year but after 5 year you will not get it yeah so this is called annuity but if you make some arrangement with the bank that hey i keep this money till i die and you promise that you will pay me 5% rate of interest yeah then every year you get the fixed amount then it become perpetuity perpetuity is the, the the root word is perpetual and what is perpetual continuous forever eternal never changes yeah so let's assume that and by the way before i before we move further uh there is a formula let me 
first stop sharing it because then we can only understand it. There is a formula of finding the present value of perpetuity and the formula is cash flows divide by uh, the discount rate discount factor okay discount discount factor the cash flow we assume that we get 27 20 each year all right and let's say that the risk free rate which we have in this case remain 8% mm -hmm. let's say that the 8% that we talk would remain constant 0.08 and when you divide it, it becomes it become a dollar three forty three forty. It means for the lifetime, for the lifetime, the levered firm would be levered firm would be more valuable than the unlevered company by 340. And if you look at this formula, where does this 340 comes from? If I try to find out a shortcut or kind of formula, it is 34%. It is 34% of your debt. And your debt was, by the way, don't forget, $1,000. So if I have to create a gen generalization, the formula, it will be corporate tax rate times, times debt. So corporate tax rate multiplied by debt would be the present value of this lifelong perpetuity which the levered company is getting, uh, but the unlevered company is not getting. Yeah? Sounds logical. So 27.20 is for one year. And that was the tax rate multiplied by the interest. But when you multiply the, the tax rate with the debt, it becomes for the lifelong. It become a perpetuity, it become the present value. So if you want to find that, hey, if 27.20, I'm getting in year 2020, what would be the for the rest of the life, this value? What will the total valuation? So you value that 27.20, which you get for one year for the lifelong, its value would be 340. It's like for the present value is very important because uh, just imagine you retire, uh, you have an option that you get the pension till you leave the world. Mm -hmm. But this insurance company or the pension company give you an option that, hey, why don't we agree on an X amount that you take it today? <laughs> and no, no, no monthly, no yearly pension. Let's, let's arrive at some value that you would get for the whole life. So instead of giving you for the whole life, I give you one lump sum payment then you will find out that, hey, this is the perpetuity, and then you divide it by the discount factor, and that would determine the present value. Yeah, so that's a valuation part. But anyways, this is how we derive the formula of this uh, this cash flow, which come from the balance sheet liability side. And the, which rate of discount you should use? Well, in uh, as a rule of thumb, you should always be using the discount, uh, which um, with the, the the risk which company is exposed to. Okay, um, 
you know that we we have the base rate of interest plus risk premium mm -hmm. so that would be used as a uh, discount factor for this, this purpose because the company is very in terms of risk so this is all the calculation but i i did in a very uh, shortcut or in a quick manner but otherwise if you want to go through the full theoretical slides you can go through here the present value of debt tax shield So the value of the unlevered company would be equal to uh, the, the value of the unlevered company plus the present value of tax shield. It could be possible that you don't get the tax shield. It could be possible that you don't have enough income uh, to pay to, uh, after you pay tax, nothing is left for the shareholders and they are having losses. Uh, but then we also know that in, in many companies, if you have the loss, uh, you can recover, when, when you have losses, you will never pay tax. And if you never pay tax, you, there's no debt tax shield, right? But we also know that if you have a loss and in the past you have paid the tax from your profits, you get the refund from the tax man. Like in the, in the US, uh, if you are having losses for three consecutive years, you can start getting refund from the previously paid taxes. So by that argument, uh, it will not affect our calculation. They would still remain the same, TC multiplied by debt. Task seven, very important. I'm reading the text so that we understand. And if you don't understand, please let me know. Choose a levered company. And here I put a disclaimer. Well, most companies are levered companies in, in the first place. Calculate the present value of debt tax shield over a period of three years. Over a period of three years. Over a three year period, yeah. Over a uh, three year period. Compare with the imaginary situation, assume that all debt is equity. So you need, a com you need to take a company and obviously the company you will pick up will have some debt. Very rare that you would pick up a company with no debt. And by the way, you can pick up one of the companies which you picked up for the previous task so that it relates. In fact, it's good that you choose one of them. Uh, you assume that that company's debt is zero. So first of all, what you do, you, you know that this company has a debt, this company has a tax, okay? All you need to do is multiply the effective corporate tax rate with the amount of debt. And where do you find the debt, by the way? You find the debt in the balance sheets liability side. There is some uh, conceptual differences, and I give you choice. You can pick any one of the concept, but stick with that. The one school of thought says that when you are calculating the finance debt, only take the long-term debt. So don't, don't take short-term finance debt. So don't take the current finance debt, but only take the long uh, the, the what do you call long non current non current uh, finance debt? I give you a choice. You want to take one or you want to take both? I think I'll go with both if I were you. So I would add both uh, finance debt, uh, current plus non current. And what are the other names of finance debt? I know that the balance sheet phrases, because these are made by accountants, they, they might not use the same phrases which you are looking forward and I, I i know you have been through this struggle before as well we all go through there's no escape uh sometimes we call it debt sometimes we call it borrowings financial borrowings uh even finance lease is also uh, called the same thing and in in some exceptional situation you can you can also hear the phrase read the phrase interest bearing liabilities <laughs> so there are different expressions but as long as you know, and if you find difficulty in finding the exact uh, figure, 
uh, please let me know next time when we meet. You multiply that amount. You multiply that amount with the effective corporate tax rate. And to get the effective corporate tax rate, you need to come back to the income statement. And the effective corporate tax is the tax you pay divided by what? The profit before tax. Yeah? That would give you the effective tax rate. Multiply both values, effective tax rate and the amount of finance debt. That would give you that would give you the value which the company, when it's levered, it has. And then you can make an interpretation, hey, this number which I found would have been missing. This number would have been missing from the company's value if this company was no debt company, means unlevered company. You get my point? So by multiplying the effective corporate tax rate and the amount of debt you reach at a figure, and that figure would have been missing if this company was zero debt company. This is how you calculate and interpret the... I forgot to, I forgot to mention one thing, um, my apologies. Uh, out of my excitement. I forgot. This is called, when you say TC multiplied by debt, uh, in theory, we call it debt tax shield. Debt tax shield. So it's a very important concept. It can be a very good thesis topic also in the future if you want to do some research and you can calculate the debt tax shield of companies in one country and then you calculate the debt tax shield in the companies of a different country or maybe in the one sector or the other sector or maybe in the one industry and the other industry or maybe before covid or after covid so there are different ways you can calculate and compare and see that if there is a change in the corporate tax debt tax shield or not it's a very important uh, theoretical concept um and when we were only multiplying, uh, when we were only multiplying the corporate tax rate with the amount of interest, without making it, uh, without treating it as a perpetuity, interest payment. Yeah. Then this is called. Then this is called interest tax shield. So 27.20 is your interest tax shield. But when you find the perpetuity, uh, the present value of this uh, cash flow over the lifetime, then it becomes debt tax shield. Okay, uh, It's same, the tax rate would remain same, but the first time you multiply with the interest payments, uh, but next time you multiply with the amount of debt. Um, You start living happily forever. I mean, this is how that's the end of the story, basically. Right. This was all about uh, having the argument with uh, two Nobel laureate. Uh, uh, Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller that uh, the liability side also creates value. And then very briefly, I want to discuss with you the weighted average cost of capital. I think I discussed it before you and I think this, this, this part is also available. By the way, uh, in the main spreadsheet, which we have about Finair, uh, there's no debt tax shield calculations, okay? But I would remember, believe me, I would remember that by the end of the day, I would be uploading a spreadsheet about debt tax shield. Yeah. And remember, you need to calculate for three years, one year, two years, three years. It's the same company for three years. Yeah. And then observe the trend. 
and this we have done. So I think I should rather skip this slide, isn't it? Because we have, you have, first of all, we have discussed it. And secondly, the calculations are available in the FinAir uh, spreadsheet. So let's not waste time on it. Yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. The last uh, subtopic of this uh, course, I would say, is that what is the interplay between weighted average cost of capital, the firm debt, the leverage, and uh, tax or no tax? Um, without showing, I, I took the slide from Berlin uh, Meyer's book. I, I, you know, I took the picture and pasted here. Uh, but I rather take you uh, down here. Here, it's very important to understand the taxes. I am trying to bring your attention to three, three different types of T. T means tax. We know that I have been writing T subscript C for the corporate tax rate. I hope you understand, yeah? Do you recall? But then I'm also writing TP here, TP. T stands for personal income tax, P for personal. So TP means the personal tax rate, yeah? But I have not only one TP, I have two TP. One is TP alone and the other is TPE. Hmm. Do you get my point? And there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. The first TP, again, the right-hand side people, you guys are my debt holders, okay? I pay you interest, TC does not affect you, agree? TC does not affect you because you know that the interest payments have no tax burden, okay? But when you go home and at the end of the year, you know what will you do? You will be filing your income tax return, will you? You will be filing your income tax return. And what is that called? It's called personal income tax return. Then on the interest income you received, you will pay a tax. So you escape from the corporate tax rate, but you don't escape from the personal income tax. And that tax rate I address as TP. But then there's one more personal tax called TPE. This is the effective personal tax rate on equity income. Now, now you guys, you've been taxed twice now. First of, first of all, the corporate tax burden fell on you. And secondly, when you file your annual income tax return, you again pay the personal income tax. So you pay tax two times and they, they people pay tax once. But then if you ponder over, it could be possible that sum of your two taxes is equal to sum of their one-time tax. Or it could be possible that the sum of your twice taxes, double incidence, is more than the single in incidence on debt payment. But it could also be possible, hey, very interesting, that even you pay tax twice, but that sum of total tax is less than what they pay on the interest income. Do you get my point? Just because the incidence of tax falls on you twice doesn't mean that you pay more tax altogether. So in theory, everything is possible. <laughs> so now in defense of, mark my words, in defense of Modigliani and Miller, I can say that
I can say that the tax person, thanks to the tax man, the debt well, the debt holders have generated this additional value. But when we also add the personal income tax in this calculation, maybe at the end of the day, their final cash flow is same. And if it is same, then hail the martyrs, uh, Modigliani and Miller would be proved right again <laughs> by chance. Do you get my point? So when you criticize Modigliani and Miller, then your arguments is only based on the corporate tax rate. You are not including the personal income tax. So then we go further and we continue where we left. And here we have the values. The interest income, you guys had $1 interest income and the corporate tax was zero on you. You didn't pay any corporate tax, so zero. Uh, income after corporate tax is one. And then imagine that the tax man is charging 50% of your interest income and you pay 50%. And what you get at the end of the day, 50 cents. But imagine that the tax man is charging 46% on the equity income, but tax man is overly generous on equity income and says equity income, 0% interest. Like for example, once again, I gave example of Singapore. If you uh, tax rate on dividend income, which you get from the equity income basically is 0%, zero, nothing. Maybe one or 2% nowadays, but when I was there, it was, flat 0%, absolute 0%. So if there is no tax on the equity income or the dividend, you can say in this case, then you don't pay any tax on the equity income. And then the final income, the final, final income. What is the cash in hand for the equity holder? 54 cents. And what is the cash left with the debt holder? 50 cent. And guess what? At the end of the day, the equity holder is paying more, uh, is getting more. His carry home is more than the carry home of the debt holder. Even though uh, apparently when you only focus on the corporate tax, it looks very unfair. When you see the calculation up to here, it looks very unfair that the corporate tax is treating uh, the debt income overly favorably and overly unfavorably the equity income. But when you see the whole picture, it could be possible that these both figures are same or one of them is slightly more. And if you want to familiar, if you want to be familiar with one more concept, we call it a relative tax advantage. Who gets the more advantage from the final final tax? And this is the formula. And because the numerator is belonging to the debt holders, and the denominator is belonging to the equity income. If R is equal to one, it means both debt holders and equity holders at the end of the day are same. And if R is more than one, which means overall, overall tax system is favoring debt holders. And if R is less than one, it means that altogether, the tax man is pro equity income. So if you calculate R here, if you calculate R here, then you would be dividing uh, 0 0.50 with 0 0.54. And if you divide, it becomes R equal to less than one, which means this figure is less than one, this, this formula which means that the overall tax advantage is to the equity holders. Yeah, makes sense. The difference is four cents, but if, the form, if it is less than one, the, div, the division, uh, not the difference, but the division, 
then you can also say that there is a there's a relative tax advantage to the debt uh, to the to the equity holders on the contrary yeah if the figures are same the corporate tax rate doesn't fall on the interest income but on the equity income but see this is very interesting the tax on the personal equity income is still 0%. But the tax man has reduced the tax on the dividend, uh, on the debt income from 50% to 28%. And guess what happens? The relative advantage moves away once again towards the debt holders. So in comparison, debt holders are getting more money than the equity holders but at least these calculations are convincing me more because uh, they are inclusive of all types of taxes for me this was very interesting case because even though the equity income people uh, holders are taxed twice even if it is not zero percent even if it is uh, four percent five percent uh, even then i assume that this figure would be larger than this one okay so one thing we need to clear our perception that just because you pay a tax twice doesn't mean that you pay more than those who pay it once you with me yeah so this is the way you can calculate you can bring in the discussion uh, amount of debt, the interest rate, the weighted average cost of capital. And then you also bring in the discussion, the personal income tax on equity and on debt. So when you bring all these dynamics, then we can see the picture in a more uh, broader perspective. Uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for you, I can't give you an example of the personal income tax because you know that is that vary from so we, we, we can't go that we, we can only we have to stop a discussion uh, we have to stop the tasks uh, at the debt tax shield we can't go beyond that we can't I can't bring the personal income tax in the discussion so with this uh, basically we have covered our four syllabus entire syllabus is over so Congratulations to you. <laughs> the course is over now. <laughs> From my side, at least. Yeah. So I will not discuss more contents. Even though we have only two topics, but those two topics, the fundamentals of finance, the fundamental concepts, and the leverage and the firm valuation, they are very deep down. So once again, um, I, I believe less in width, but more in depth. So yeah. So I think we have been pretty much successful in discussing things in depth. But anyways, now if you have any questions, you can ask me now. <laughs>